Okay, buongiorno a tutti, I guess we can start. So, welcome to the third colloquium of ethics uh, in the astronomy department. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Luana Persano, senior researcher at the Nestor in Pisa. And uh, just to give you some uh, very brief uh, biographical data, so Luana got her PhD from uh, University of Lecce in uh, Innovative Materials and Technologies. Then she went abroad as a Marie Curie Fellow in Greece, invited a visiting scientist at Harvard and the University of Illinois. She's one great expert of uh, nanofabrication techniques and the lithographic techniques used to develop smart materials combining particles, fibers, and other uh, components to realize this uh, smart uh, and uh, functional mix. And uh, she's also co-founder of a spin-off, Soft Materials and Technologies, a company focused on the development in, of micro and nanotechnologies for the production of nanostructured soft materials through the exploitation of conventional soft lithographies and electrospinning. And uh, thanks to all uh, her research and study, Luana received uh, several prizes. I just mentioned the Belisario Award as Young Talent in Industrial Engineering in 2011. In today's colloquium, uh, Dr. Persano will uh, tell us about this uh, beautiful nanofibers which can be used to realize with a low cost technology very smart materials can found very broad applications from energy to uh, smart labeling is uh, all yours the stage okay so thank you very much and uh, thank you very much introduction for invitation and uh, thank you very much for being here today um, uh, I am particularly uh, pleased uh, pleasant to be here and particularly excited because uh, as I mentioned before after I guess a couple of years this is my first talk in present so excitation is very high for this experience so the title of my talk today is uh, Polymer Nanofibers to be used as a platform for energy harvesting and uh, smart labels. This is a, a short outline of the talk. I will first give an, introduce, an introduction to polymer nanofibers. Uh, then the talk will be mainly divided into two parts. The first one where I will show how it is possible to the piezoelectric behavior of these nanofibers to build um, energy harvesting devices. So this is a green energy. And the second part instead will be mainly devoted to uh, introduct uh, the capability to photoprogram uh, some topologies of nanofibers that can be used as a smart label uh, that can be of great help uh, in the perishable, uh, in the supply chain, let's say, or perishable food. So let's start with the polymer nanofibers. Uh, so far, there are several technologies which are available to shape polymers at the nanoscale. What do I mean with nanoscale? In the the polymer uh, within the purpose of this talk for nanoscale, I mean a range between uh, tens of nanometers and hundreds of nanometers. Uh, these uh, technologies are, can be based on uh, exposure, such as in A, where you use some polymers which are sensitive to UV light, and uh, this uh, technology enables you to pattern the surface. Uh, uh, such the, the pattern reported here. So in some areas you will have the polymer, and some others not. And this technology has been largely used in organic light emitting devices, for example. Then there are other two uh, techniques which are commonly used, uh, which are um, soft lithography and nanoimprinting lithography. 
In both cases, one use a stamp to transfer the pattern on the stamp to the target material. The main difference between these two uh, te techniques uh, is that in one case, you use a soft elastomer to uh, drive this uh, transformation. Uh, in the other case, for non-imprinting, you use a rigid stamp. In both cases, you put the stamp in contact with the surface, and uh, you can drive the temperature above the transition temperature of the material to uh, induce patterning. And in the case of non-imprinting, you may also apply an external pressure. Uh, our technique is based on template-assisted uh, lithography, where you have uh, a template with some holes, for example, you fill the holes with the material of interest, and then you can remove, uh, finally, your template to get, for example, non-wires of material. Uh, the last technology is electrospinning, and this is the one I will talk more within uh, this talk today. So, this is, uh, uh, let me say, a quite uh, easy technology. Why I say easy? Because uh, it is just based on the use of uh, three key elements, which are a spinneret, a voltage bias generator, and a metallic collector. So uh, you have a primer solution that you feed to constant flow rate through the spinneret, and you apply a bias voltage between the needle of the spinneret and a metallic plate, which is named collector. What happens is that when you start feeding your solution, a drop is ejected from the needle. And once the electric field is applied, this drop experiences uh, uh, many forces. There are tensions and the viscoelasticity that keeps the drop in its initial shape. But when the electric field overcomes a certain Pressure, the, the drop starts to deform, and uh, after the formation, when you still increase the field, uh, the polymer is uh, ejected in the form of a jet from uh, the needle, as you can see here. In the time of a flight between uh, the needle and the collector, the jet experiences eye stretching forces, uh, but also uh, the solvent the solution starts to evaporate. This allows one to collect nanofibers at the solid state on the collector. Um, depending on the shape of the collector one is going to use, the, you can uh, ensemble this fiber on the substrate with the different morphologies. And here I reported some representatives, topologies of a collector that one can use. And the final out is that, for example, if you have a flat plate, you have a nanofibers distributed in a random fashion. Uh, if instead you have a couple of plates with a gap in between, or you have a rotating collector, uh, what you get is that these fibers can be tightly aligned towards a certain direction. Okay, these are scanning electron microscope, but how these fibers look like uh, by visual inspection. So this is a photograph of uh, one topology of fibers that we did are PMMA fibers uh, inside this uh, bottle. And as you can see, they look like paper. And um, both of these, they are typically named as a uh, non-woven mats but they can also be shaped in a different way. For example, they can be uh, arranged in the form of ribbon, such as this one, and the ribbon can be twisted to form a yarn, and a couple of yarn can be twisted together to form a coil. What uh, I uh, like a lot of this coil reported here is that it shows very high elasticity, things that he can be deformed and so elongated up to 700 times more with respect to its initial length. So, 
uh, nanofibers, uh, because of their shape, because of the conformation of the chain inside, inside the, the nanofiber induced by the process used, uh, have some peculiarities that make, uh, make them very interesting for several applications. Here I report some of them. Uh, first of all, they are characterized by an extremely long length. In principle, if we have one jet and you spin for a long time, more than one hour, you can get fibers long than kilometers and uh, remind that the diameters can be uh, of well below 100 nanometers uh, so they are characterized by the high aspect ratio and high aspect ratio means large surface area so they are particularly interesting for applications in fields such as sensing or filtration where uh, with uh, such a large surface area, you can uh, increase a lot the sensitivity of your device. Uh, and also, you can decorate the surface of the fiber. For example, they can be uh, porous on the surface, or you can also decorate them by the use of nanoparticles or through protrusions on their surface by increasing, again, the surface area. Um, then, as uh, you have seen before, and as uh, you can also see from this guy here, they have an intrinsic three-dimensional character. So, these are objects that you can handle very easily, and, uh, but when you handle them, you have to remind that they are made by nanomaterials. So, they are an ensemble of nanomaterials, so we have a double landscape topography in this sense. Uh, the last point I want to stress is that by using this technology, you can really use a large variety of materials, a large variety of polymers, of hybrid materials, which means polymers and inorganic fillers as well. So you can make fibers with different functional properties. And in addition to this, one can also decide to make fibers and functionalize their surface at the end of the process. Uh, let's go now towards uh, the, the first part of the talk, which is uh, how can we exploit the electric behavior of this material to produce energy? So uh, it is well known that uh, oops. it is well known that uh, piezoelectricity is the um, capability of a certain materials to generate a voltage when they are deformed. So when you apply a mechanical stress to these materials. Uh, so what happens? Uh, you apply a, an external force in a certain direction, uh, the materials deform, and the charges of opposite signs accumulate in the direction opposite to the force, so on the opposite uh, faces of the materials, on the opposite Physics of the materials. And if you uh, put there some proper contacts, metallic, for example, you can drive these charges towards an electrical circuit. And so finally, you can get an output voltage. The most uh, used piezoelectric materials are inorganic. Here are some representative examples reported. As you can see, they are crystalline materials. In particular, they are characterized by a non centro symmetric structure. In most cases, they are tetragonal. And of course, they are characterized by high piezoelectric constant. In particular, uh, the perovskite PZT um, is the most used and piezoelectric one. However, it is based on lead. And as you know, there are several concerns in the use of lead. For commercial purpose and devices, so it is something that needs to be avoided. Uh, polymers uh, exhibit piezoelectricity too. Uh, in particular, the, the polymer which is most uh, studied and also most used is a polyvinylidene fluoride and uh, he is a, it is a synthetic polymer. Here is reported the molecular 
structure of the material. Uh, there is a carbon backbone and then some fluorine and hydrogen atoms. The origin of piezoelectricity in these materials is still subject of uh, debate because uh, these materials is a semi crystalline and the question is does the piezoelectricity belongs to the crystalline part or to the amorphous part or something in the middle so to the interface between crystalline and amorphous phase there is not a clear answer to this question but there is a lot of literature and a lot of clear evidence that if you increase one of the crystalline phase of the materials which is the beta phase of this material you can increase the piezoelectric properties of the materials and this is because this beta phase uh, is characterized by a, a distribution of fluorine atoms and uh, hydrogen atoms uh, in this sense so the opposite with respect to the carbon backbone and this uh, due to the electronegativity difference between uh, these two atoms enables to form a, a dipole along the backbone so perpendicular to the backbone and uh, this dipole of course enable uh, the formation of a polarization vector and so piezoelectricity in the material however as i mentioned before this is a synthetic poly but this is biocompatible but we can do more so uh, cellulose is the most abundant biopolymer on earth and as you know uh, most of wood is done is uh, composed of cellulose so wood is composed of cellulose fibers and these are the typical sites and the cellulose fibers are composed of cellulose fibrils with typical sizes each fibril is composed of crystalline regions and amorphous region and they are generally very aligned and oriented towards a certain direction uh, wood is piezoelectric and uh, piezoelectricity um, depends so belongs uh, from crystalline regions mainly this is why most of the uh, cellulose nanocrystals have been exploited to generate piezoelectric behavior uh, piezoelectricity has also been demonstrated in achille tendons and achille tendons are mainly constituted by type 1 collagen molecules which is one of the most abundant proteins humans and the uh, collagen um, are in a shape of a triple helix of amino acid and uh, they are again arranged in a very ordered form uh, and they form microfibrils which are again arranged in, a, in an ordered way to form fibrils and also collagen is uh, piezoelectric uh, one idea is that the presence of uh, hydrogen atoms on the helix enable uh, the establishment of a piezo potential, so the formation of electrical charges which form a dipole upon the formation. The last example I want to mention is bone. Bone, uh, the main constituent of bone is the, the bone matrix, which is mainly done by type 1 collagen and hydroxyhepatite nanocrystals. Uh, what happens is that when the bone uh, is deformed, so when a stress is applied, through collagen uh, charges move towards the bone surface. And uh, a dipole, an electrical dipole, is established because uh, charges are no more in equilibrium. And the interesting point is that uh, this mechanism is at the foundation of the reconstruction of our bonds because the formation of an electrical dipole um, uh, 
let's say, a recall osteoblast cells, which are the cells that build our bone. And osteoblast, um, in the point where uh, the mechanical stress has been applied, deposit calcium and other minerals that help in the reconstructions of bones. Um, so, piezoelectricity in polymers and in natural materials uh, uh, can be achieved. There are some conditions that need to be fulfilled. So, uh, they are here reported. The, the, the material should be non centrosymmetric. In most cases, it should be semi crystalline. Uh, as we showed before, an orientation is required, and this orientation can be achieved by the application of an external stress, a mechanical stress, so it is the mechanical drawing, or also by the use of an electrical polling, so applying it to the materials a very high electric field. Uh, what are the main advantages of synthetic polymers? Um, with respect to inorganic materials, of course, the, the ease of processing, uh, the low cost, the capability to make large area device and their intrinsic flexibility. Additional advantage comes from the use of natural polymers, uh, which are non-toxicity, eco-friendly, and then they also will help us toward a more sustainable future. Uh, there is one drawback, which is uh, the piezoelectric constant, which is lower with respect to inorganics, and in particular with respect to lead-based inorganic materials. So, which are the advantages of using uh, electrospinning to make nanofibers and in particular to make piezoelectric nanofibers? Uh, it can be summarized in this slide. So, first of all, uh, through the use of the electric field, you make uh, an on-site polling. So, you don't need uh, additional treatment to the material. So you just make fibers and you apply an electric field. So the material, the resulting material is already pulled. So it is already piezoelectric. And then um, during the time of flight, uh, a sort of a mechanical drawing is uh, applied to the jet. And this is because the jet uh, proceeds towards the collectors at very high speed and uh, um, acceleration of about 10 to 4 centimeters square, centimeter by second square are imposed. And these uh, eye stretching forces, uh, of course, uh, may have uh, an important uh, impact on the distribution of the chains within the fibers. Uh, and uh, this is why, in most cases, they can confer uh, orientational anisotropy which can be very useful for the exploitation of piezoelectricity. Uh, the last point is that in addition to this, one can use a rotating collector to deposit fibers, and in particular, one can use a fast rotating collector. So in this case, it gives an additional orientation to the fiber. However, most of the theory uh, so far available is based on uh, crystalline materials. So if we consider an inorganic uh, 3D solid, uh, piezoelectricity in this material is generally exploited and conventionally achieved by applying a force in the direction of the spontaneous polarization vector of the materials. And this direction is established by the, the crystalline shape of the Material. This is not the case of flexible polymers because in these uh, uh, materials, when you apply a stress along a certain direction, uh, you can cause a remarkable deformations also in the perpendicular direction. And this is the reason why. In order to rationalize this behavior, uh, our case study was uh, to, to make a nanofiber, suspend these nanofibers uh, with the two edges fixed, and uh, uh, 
it is uh, free to uh, vibrate and oscillate in the vertical direction. And uh, um, we argued that if you apply the force perpendicular to the main length of the fiber in this direction, we can get the polarization in the plane orthogonal to the applied force. So um, the transverse contribution to piezoelectricity in these materials can be very important. Uh, this is a, just a scheme to show how we build uh, the device very easily. Uh, the, the final form of the device is uh, here reported. So you have um, uh, the, the fiber, the beam, 700 diameters of, uh, yeah, the, dia the diameter was uh, 700 nanometers. The length of the fiber in the device was up to one centimeter. And we delivered uh, localized forts in this direction uh, by the use of a nano indenter. And uh, of course, we measure the voltage generated uh, from uh, the fiber at the edges. So in a configuration, which is not the standard one, because in the standard one, if apply the force in this direction, I should get the voltage with the electrodes on bottom of the fibers while we are going to take voltage here. So at the edges of the fibers, uh, these are the main results. So. When you increase the applied force, you increase the uh, deformation of the fibers and you can increase the, uh, the voltage output from the fiber. And uh, uh, this behavior uh, can be uh, captured by some uh, ab initio studies that have been um, performed in collaboration with our friends uh, um, at CNR Nano, Arrigo Carzorari. And another interesting point uh, is that uh, the, um, there is a dependence on the voltage output from the point where you apply the force with respect to the age of the fiber. So this parameter A seems to become very important and uh, some analytical studies have been performed by our collaborators at Northwestern University. And um, the, the interesting point is that uh, this device which is a single nano beam can be used as a position sense, for example. And what we got is that the best agreement between theory and experiments in our case was where uh, this parameter A is in between 1.5 and 2.5 millimeters. So this is an additional application of, of this kind of uh, uh, material and devices. But what happens if instead of using one single fiber, I use uh, many fibers? And what's the difference if I use fibers which are isolated, so which means they are far away from each other, or if they are uh, in a dense array configuration? So again, uh, we we delivered the well calibrated force on these two typologies of devices. Uh, in this case, we, we did the larger devices, and so we used a, a tip with one millimeter uh, diameter. And uh, the interesting result was that with the same force applied in the case of the array, what we get is a, a voltage which is a two order of magnitude higher with respect to isolated, isolated fibers. And again, to, to rationalize this behavior uh, in collaboration with uh, Laura De Laurentiis, uh, we developed a numerical simulation um, uh, by using uh, a finite element multiphysics platform. So the idea was uh, how a polarization along the length of the fibers uh, is uh, affected by the packaging of the fibers. And uh, to answer to this question, uh, we um, 
we studied the two different uh, uh, patterning, uh, or an horizontal one and the vertical one, as you can see in the picture. Uh, the first result on isolated fiber uh, tell us that the um, the, the intensity of the polarization along the fiber uh, depends length of the fiber so we could save uh, a computational time by simulating a very short fibers uh, uh, with respect to this that we use in the experiments uh, the second interesting point was that the the polarization depends on the shape of the cross-section and so we found that the cylindrical fibers are uh, generate much higher voltage with respect to section to a rectangular curve section uh, finally uh, when building uh, our array we take a fiber uh, we put another one close another one close so what, what happens is that uh, we do not register any voltage increment in the case of uh, a rectangular cross-section fibers on the contrary, if we have a cylindrical fiber, um, there is an increment of the voltage output. And this can be explained uh, as an electromechanical interaction among uh, adjacent fibers, which is named a cooperative effect that uh, restrains uh, the formation in the transversal direction, thus increasing uh, the transversal strain and thus increasing uh, the piezoelectricity. Uh, if we make the array uh, vertically, we can increase even more the voltage out from the material because here there are the two contributions. The first one is the cooperative effect I mentioned before. The second one is that one is increasing the thickness of the material, so it is reducing the stiffness of the material itself. Um, electromechanical coupling can take place at the fiber level, as we have seen so far, but also at the molecular scale. In order to exploit um, this coupling, we, we build uh, hybrid fibers where uh, directly in the solution used for electrospinning, uh, we put in contact a piezoelectric polymer and a light emitting dye. These are the fibers that we, uh, we achieved, and in this case, uh, you can also, the, the point is that uh, by using electrospinning, uh, so by blending different materials with different functionalities, you can get one materials with both functionalities. So we have light emission from these fibers and the piezoelectricity as well. Uh, and what we were interested to understand was um, can we affect properties of the materials by applying an external stress to the material and in order to test this uh, we put our fibers in a device configuration on um, a couple of uh, uh, linear stages and we bended uh, the material also by and we did some cycles of bending here on, on the right there are some uh, pictures captured by a fast camera in, in the different position of the sample so uh, then we build an optical setup of course in order to uh, to measure the light emitted by uh, by these fibers and um, the setup was built in order to keep the photon in the same point of the sample and to avoid any spurious effect related to the fact that when you are bending the materials you are keeping your fibers uh, uh, closer uh, to uh, the detection system so uh, everything was arranged in order to avoid this spurious effect and the final result is that if you measure the photoluminescence from the fibers uh, depending on the position of 
uh, of the fibers, which means depending on uh, uh, the amount of stress that you are applying to the fiber during bending, you can see that the main peak of the emission can be shifted in a reversible way. So it can be shifted with few meters. Uh, according to uh, the strain rate that is uh, applied, as you can see here in the pictures. So, uh, again, um, through uh, density functional theories in collaboration with the Fabio della Sala, we, we try to uh, rationalize this behavior. And uh, here the point is that we have uh, uh, three systems at the scale. We have the piezo polymer and we have the organic dye. The organic dye um, uh, it has um, a counter ion inside and this counter ion interacts with the dye, so with the molecular dye and with the piezo polymer. And when a stress is applied, you change the interdistance between the counter ion and the piezo chain. What we got was that uh, the counter ion is going to interact with the positive tail of the polymer, which, which are H atoms, and uh, create um, a, a mechanical for states, so create states with the different uh, surface, uh, um, uh, so with the different. Uh, energy surface states and according uh, to the interdistance you can draw you can drive the material different energy surface state which correspond to different emission wavelengths so finally theoretically one can tune the emission of the material up to 20 nanometers and this is indeed very interesting so the formation of this mechanophor state the molecular level. So in conclusion, uh, I will shortly summarize. I show you some of the capabilities of these uh, piezoelectric nanofibers to generate uh, energy for sure, but also how you can work to build uh, devices which uh, different functionalities and how you can exploit the electromechanical coupling both at the macro scale and at the molecular scale. Uh, the last part of the talk will be uh, devoted to, to show uh, this, um, the use of nanofiber for smart labeling. So these are goods that you uh, know very well. And you also know that on the label of this good, you can find uh, two indications. So the expiration date, which is the date of mean durability of the product, uh, such as uh, the interval of time within which property qualities and the specification are preserved, but uh, under proper storage conditions. So in this case, it is safe to uh, eat the product or to take the pills. The other indication you can find on the label is the suitable storage temperature. So when the storage temperature uh, becomes inappropriate, uh, something can happen and uh, every year this happens. So millions of illness are caused by exposition to inappropriate temperature of uh, perishable products such as foods and drugs. And these are mainly related to intoxication because there is a, a, a fast rate of growth of some bacteria such as uh, Escherichia coli, Listeria or Salmonella. In the in fish, one can also experience gombroid poisoning uh, related to histamine, uh, while in the case of a vaccine, for example, some disease can be caused uh, by suboptimal potency of the vaccine that has been deteriorated because of uh, inappropriate storage. Um, today, the control of the supply chain uh, is uh, strictly regulated 
for the manufacturer, the wholesalers, the distributors, and the, the transporters. So they have to take care of the um, of the storage condition of uh, the goods uh, throughout is their life until they arrive to the customer. The customer has no control, has no indication, uh, has no suggestion. Uh, so, for example, uh, inappropriate handling by the customer at domestic storage conditions can become uh, uh, a source of illness as well. So, when a good is on our table, we really have no idea whether the storage life of the product was safe or not. So there is a, a strong demand for devices that can follow the goods from its production to its consumption. And these devices are called time temperature indicators, and they uh, indicate the accumulated time temperature history of the product. So they can also highlight an exposure to excessive temperature. Um, some products are already on the market, but maybe you have not seen them because they are not so spread. And the reason are uh, because most of them are based on electronics and there are some concern in the use of electronics for this purpose. Uh, another reason is that in many cases they use liquids to work. And again, concern about the diffusion of toxic elements in the goods are. Um, and the, the last one, uh, uh, not, there are a couple of two more. So one is they are mostly colored, so they are not clearly uh, visible and they are unsuitable for colorblind people. And then they are very expensive. So most of the goods cost would depend on the price of this time temperature indicator. What do you need to build a time temperature indicator? Uh, you need a material which show a continuous and irreversible change of some physical chemical properties. And this change must depend on the time temperature profile under by the product. So what we did was to make an optically programmable, conformable, non-colorimetric indicator, uh, which was based on uh, a nanofibers, nano non-woven web, 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 sorry, uh, that are encoded by the cross-linking degree uh, of the fibers. And uh, these devices operate visual contrast so you just see the difference uh, by eye uh, the material that we used uh, is a native photoresist the name is uh, su8 uh, this is an epoxy based photoresist um, it is it mainly consists of two elements which is uh, um, a photo acid generator and the base uh, the principle, the working principle of this material is that you can usually coat uh, a film of the material on a substrate, then you use a mask and you expose to UV a part of it. After that, you bake the system above a certain temperature and then you develop the materials. And as I show you in the first slide, you can achieve some lines of the materials, which means and pattern your surface. Here is an example of a photolithography uh, performed with uh, these materials. The, the key elements are to exposure to UV light and uh, um, temperature. And so when you expose the material to UV light, you activate uh, this uh, photo acid generator. And when you exceed some um, temperature by eating the material, you can enhance the cross-linking of the materials. So the final result is that the region of the material which are exposed to UV light undergo a process of cross-linking. So they become uh, very stable 
surface. Uh, the first point was uh, to be able to make fibers with this uh, uh, resin. It was not too trivial. We did the many attempts, but finally we got some uh, fibers quite uniform with the diameter of about 100 nanometers. Um, and look at this uh, uh, picture, which are microscope uh, images. So fibers as sun looks like this but if you keep the sample to to ambient environment for uh, say half hour one hour or nine hour or 26 hour you see that uh, slowly you miss the shape so they start uh, something like melting because as i mentioned you before without uv light they are not stable so uh, finally, one without UV light, instead of fibers can get something like this, so a porous film. So what we did, um, we, uh, we make fibers, we deposit them on a surface, we then expose all the fibers to UV light, and this is the first photoprogramming step, which means by choosing the proper dose of exposure, we could set the working temperature of the device. The second step was a second photoprogramming, so a second exposure to light. In this case, we the mask, so we expose some areas, some other not. And with this process, we are encoding a message in the material but this message is a sign and one can see the sign only if the, the device is exposed to inappropriate temperatures which means to temperature above the ones that we set in the first photoprogramming of course we did several studies to understand how to, to make this, uh, and in particular, we, we can change the degree of cross-linking by changing the UV dose during the first photoprogramming process. And uh, uh, what is important is that the, the transmission property, so how much light is through the sample, changes if you increase the exposure temperature of the sample. So you have a clear difference in the aspect, the visual aspect of your materials, you will see. And of course, uh, the, the reflection of the materials will decrease. We studied how transmission and reflection changes for exposure at different doses and for longer periods, as you can see, for several days. And just to try to make it clearer, so this is a, a sample of uh, um, nanofibers on a substrate. We did the two photoprogramming and we put the sample to 55 Celsius degree. And you see that the message that was encoded is now clear, but it was not before, okay? Um, just for curiosity, I, I want to show you um, at the macroscopic scale, which means by SCM, what you can see um, in an interval around this uh, H, H letter of hot. Okay, so this is the H, and you see that at the beginning, you have just fibers on the surface, and you cannot see any letter. But then when you increase the time, the heating time, you see that these H letters appear and it is always clearer. So what's going on around? Let's first say that H is a, a part where UV light entered in the material, okay? So it was exposed to UV. And uh, uh, the second interesting part is that if you follow here, you see that the part that was not exposed uh, at a certain point disappeared in the form of fibers. So fibers from the bottom of the surface are start melting together. 
And when they melt, they totally change their appearance. So they change their transmission properties. Uh, this behavior can be rationalized so by the T matrix formalism. So um, basically, the web of nanofibers uh, has a very high uh, scattering ratio so a lot of light is backscattered from the fibers this is not the same for the film so these are nanofibers but when you increase the temperature they become like a film and so the film became totally transparent okay and uh, uh, just to make uh, an example of a device we, we deposited these fibers on a paper uh, commercial paper uh, and these are fibers on a commercial paper and uh, um, we uh, we covered these fibers with the plus yellow plastic foil which acts as a uv filter and we put the device on top of different goods that we exposed to sunlight for example milk or some drugs and of course, after 30 minutes of exposure, uh, we measured the temperature of the goods. For milk, it was 31 Celsius, for this drug, 42. And as you can see at the beginning, you could not see anything on top of the label. But when you increase the temperature, you can read the message encoded that in this case was uh, do not use. So, uh, with this, I would like to thank all people working uh, in my group uh, in Pisa, both at the CNR and at the University of Pisa, in particular, Andre Dario. And of course, uh, thank you very much at the funding uh, agency. And before thanking you, um, I want to just remind you uh, to this link, uh, which is a right play link where you can find some additional information in case uh, you have some curiosity on the device that we realized, TTI device. And so with this, I conclude and I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you for this fascinating talk, in particular the first, uh, first part was really fascinating. I, I first, uh, I just have one curiosity and then I'm open for questions, of course. For the other, for the piezo fibers, uh, like you show some, of course, uh, piezo electricity and so on, but uh, at a very nanoscale. So if uh, one wants to use uh, this technology to, for energy harvesting, for real applications, uh, do you have some demonstrators where you can really, I mean, uh, get some energy out yeah, there? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I had... Nanovolts, I mean, nano <laughs> joule or whatever, I mean, oh, real... Yeah. Uh, I have not enough, um, I had not enough... So can we avoid uh, using nuclear... <laughs> okay, okay, so... With the, the, the question <laughs> is interesting. Uh, I have a couple of answers for you. So first one is... I had not enough space to say all, and the answer is yes, of course. And so uh, our last experiment uh, in an unpublished paper that we are going to write by using a biomaterials, so we achieved 30 volts, which is a, a, a power of the order of a milliwatt per centimeter square. And this second uh, uh, answer that I can give is by using this nano generator we cannot save the world because the energies are the one that I mentioned before so we can achieve milliwatts but not more however they can be very useful in applications where uh, there is a need to power to self-power consumer electronics think about Internet of Things, for example. There, you need to have a distributed network of sensors um, uh, and other devices, electronic devices, that are capable to give different signals. And in that case, each of them can be powered by this kind of devices. 
So distributed energy, but the energy is not the nuclear energy. So mm -hmm. just milli words, okay? Okay. Are there other questions? Sir? Thank you for the presentation. And just a curiosity about uh, the, the electro spinning. Uh, so, you mentioned that you, you press, so you have, I guess, a flow rate. Uh, and uh, can you give us some details about uh, the time that it requires to produce like a kilometers, uh, yeah. uh, kilometer, a kilometer or something like that? And uh, about the last part, when you mentioned that you produce a fiber with SU8, that's impressive. So I'm using SU8 for fiber. So, for that the curiosity, it's better to use a high viscosity or low viscosity because I guess you will evaporate the solvent during the electricity. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, about numbers for electro spinning uh, with the laboratory scale equipment, one can uh, produce uh, grams of fibers per day. Okay, the typical flow rate of a few millimeters per hour of a solution, uh, depending on the polymer and the solvent you use. In one hour, you can uncover uh, at laboratory scale, of course, an area of uh, 10 by 10 centimeters square uh, with the web uh, exhibit thicknesses from tens to hundreds of micrometers. Regarding the way, it was really complicated. Uh, usually, um, to, uh, to be successful in electrospinning, you need to use a highly viscous solution. In the case of electrospinning, we could not use the bare uh, of SU8, do not use the bare SU8 resin, but we add some solvent which uh, enables faster evaporation of the materials and uh, in particular. There are all the pictures that I show you with the different beads or fibers with the different sides were done by using different amount of atom embedded in the starting solution. Very nice presentation. And uh, I'd like to know uh, in the last uh, last example you showed the one where you go ground you need the melting inside of the <laughs> of the of this SUV. Uh, you showed temperature from 15 to 30, 50 degrees. Usually for food you still have to stay to four, maybe to lower temperature. You can achieve also this. And in case uh, you have an effect of aging of the system, so it's going to melt with time and in case at different temperatures. So okay, so this is stable, so you get back from that temperature, and after one year, you will find that same temperature. Okay, so um, the, to make this paper and to make this experiment uh, takes a lot, took a lot of time, to be honest, because we had to take care of the long term stability of the materials over time in order to define the shelf life, the final shelf life if we want to make a device. So we followed the behavior for months, but not for years and uh, it was stable depending of course on uh, uh, the working temperature that we used uh, regarding the first question uh, we, we made a careful analysis of uh, uh, all the goods drugs and the vaccine so far available and uh, if you have a look to the paper you will have these tables uh, where we saw which are the working temperature for this kind of materials and uh, those are the ones that we were targeting. So there, there was something in between uh, 20 and 30 Celsius degree. Uh, to go below was uh, a bit more complicated with this kind of materials for several reasons.
Okay. Um, just, sorry, one moment. Wait for. I have a question on the first part. Yeah. I mean, is uh, is sort of battery for you? So, do you have an idea of the internal resistance that you can have in this? Uh, uh, the resistance is very high. These are dielectric materials. So uh, on the mega scale, okay, mega. -on. More questions? So, no, also please. Uh, one second, please. Let me, let's get the mic. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, my question is uh, that the piezoelectric polymers has the lower uh, piezoelectric constant compared with the inorganic uh, materials. Are you open to use the piezoelectric properties of the narrow fiber membranes? Is there have some um, solution to improve the, the properties of them? Yeah, um, you can find in literature several applicable solutions to this. I mean, however, the final numbers are one order of magnitude less with respect to inorganic materials. So uh, one can uh, uh, apply an extra polling to the chains, for example, or one can build a hybrid materials where you embed inorganic nanoparticles based, for example, on barium titanate on this. Um, and these are just a couple, but you can find many. But so, so far, the state of art does not exceed 33 yes as a coefficient, while in the case of PCT, you have a 300 and more. So, but the application are much more limited in the case of a PZT with respect to polymers. So, of course, in any case, you, you need to make a balance between uh, several factors, okay? Uh, maybe uh, high piezoelectric coefficients uh, are not necessary for certain typologies of applications, such as the ones that I mentioned before. Yes, we have a question. So we have a question live. And the question is, can you kind of elaborate more on the technique used to precisely align the nanofibers? And in particular, is it possible to create a tightly packed nanofiber anisotropic film using this technique? Uh, yeah, uh, the one that I show today is, um, concern the use of fast rotating collector. The, the collector uh, rotates at a speed about 20 milliseconds, I guess, it's a linear velocity. And uh, the rotation forces the fibers close together. And the other point which enable, that in turn enable also to increase the piezoelectric response of the material is that uh, the starting solution enable to deposit on the collector fibers which are not yet to the solid state but they are still in a molten state so uh, fibers in the molten states with the fast rotating collect and certain applied voltage enables these fibers to tighten each other and to create uh, some uh, point of joints among them that make the device much more stable, much more mechanically robust, and would enhance the piezoelectric properties. Uh, I don't know if the question 
I, I didn't understand what do they mean to make a film exactly. So finally, you, you don't get a film because you still have fibers. So you have a macro sample, but it is made of an array of fibers, not film. If you want a film, you should eat the sample above a certain temperature, but I guess it's not the winter. I have one final question. So, so, uh, so far, I just showed about uh, laboratory applications. Are there some industrial uh, plants uh, building uh, yeah. I mean, uh, various uh, mass with based on this technology or not yet? Uh, yeah. We're still at the laboratory level. No, no, absolutely. Uh, among the technologies so far available to make nanomaterials and to make polymeric nanomaterials, electrospinning is the one which is close, closest to the market. I mean, there are several companies that since 10 years or more already distribute machines and equipment which enables you to build large scale device and which are for the industrial production. Okay. So, uh, you, you can make meter square materials by using electrospinning. So far, uh, the commercial, uh, the, the most, let's say, um, the, uh, the most popular uh, application of topology of fibers in commercial, in the real market, is filtration. Okay. So both uh, liquid and aerosol filtration. So most of our marks have <laughs> been done by combining electro spinning and melt spinning. Okay, the mask that's used. Um, not totally easy to use uh, some functional uh, polymers such as electric polymers with this uh, I. Um, uh, with these equipment for large scale applications because of several issues and because of the technology that is uh, much more spread for uh, large area applications is a little bit different. So it's not needle based as the one that I showed before. It is called free surface where you flow the solution within a big tubes which are drilled with all and you apply the field to the tubes and there is a collector and uh, uh, fiber are spin like this outside so you have many jets not just one jet and uh, the point is uh, some concern about uh, um, the, the uniformity of the mat on this large scale and, and also this is why some applications, they are totally fine. They are already in the market, but for others, uh, it is not yeah. yet like this. Okay. So, no more questions. So, let's thank again the speaker, Dr. Christian.